Okay, let's do it. We got our second one of these videos. Uh, this is going to be all about operator. Um, operator is definitely the uh, most useful, like native synth in Ableton, I think. Um, I use it a ton in all my music. Um, it's like the basis for probably 75% of the sounds in my music. Um, so we're going to get into just uh, the basics of it, kind of an intro to it and, and uh, what each of these eight tabs do and how to get some cool sounds out of it. Um, I'll involve a little bit of processing uh, with other native Ableton instruments so that y'all can see um, you know, how you can really use operator in sort of like a modular uh, ecosystem, um, the same way that Serum has like a built-in effects. Essentially, you can kind of consider os uh, operator the main oscillators for your sound, and you can just pull whatever audio effects you want um, and build out what you want out of it. So, um, I, I'm gonna inevitably have to cover uh, a couple of things in sort of just sound design basics, um, but I'm not gonna delve too far into that because there will be another video. Uh, that'll start like a four or five part sound design series um, and I'll get into like the real real fundamental concepts um, in that so anyway to get it started here when you pull in operator um, and some of your default settings might be a little different than mine um, you know granted so I'll put that back to zero all right so on the left side here you have uh, four oscillators a b c and d now by default, I'm pretty sure in almost everyone's default operator, uh, it has it routed. You can see the routing over here in this bottom right tab, basically in sequence. D routes into C, routes into B, routes into A. Now, no worries if you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. Uh, I'm going <laughs> to get to that. Um, so essentially what's happening here is A is really the only oscillator playing. If I play, um, let's, let's turn this into something that is a little more uh, audible, like a saw wave. All right, so if I start turning up the volume on oscillator B, what's happening is it's actually frequency modulating oscillator A. However, if I turn down oscillator A, there's nothing playing because really the only oscillator that's actually putting out a sound is oscillator A. It's just being modified by oscillator B. B is then modified by C, is then modified by D, all in sequence as is governed by this uh, setup right here. Now you can change how this routing works and on the far right here, to give you an example of the, the opposite end of the spectrum, gives you all four oscillators as just independent oscillators. So um, none of them route into each other, each one is playable on its own. So if I play that, you can kind of hear a, you hear a sine wave there. If I turn this one up, you hear that saw wave. If I make this a, a square wave and turn this up, turn up the chorus. So each is separate. All right, so I'll get into this global tab and all these different routings and the ways they work uh, in a moment here. So for now, I want to cover what each one of these, uh, each one of these oscillator tabs is identical in the control area down here. So I want to cover what these are doing. So first off, uh, you saw me change from a sine wave to a saw wave. You can change your wave shape in here. You got all the basic shapes, triangle, um, square, saw, sine. Uh, the D stands for digital. So it's just a digitally produced saw wave rather than like a 64-bit uh, saw wave, uh, which I guess gives you 64 harmonics uh, maybe. But yeah, it's not really as important. You'll kind of see the difference if I start playing these out. Uh, let's see here. That is a saw 64 versus, so yeah, I think it's only got like 64 harmonics present. Uh, and a saw digital takes every harmonic uh, going up the entire frequency spectrum. So you can hear it's got a lot more uh, top end Christmas to it. So anyway, uh, square digital, and then same with square, you get a triangle and a couple of different sine waves and some, some white noise as well. Um, now you have your basic ADSR envelope for your amplitude for your gain. So um, for those who aren't familiar, ADSR is attack, decay, sustain, release. Um, that is basically the, the minimum to maximum, back to sustain point, back to minimum of any given parameter. 
now that can be on filters it can be on pitch envelopes uh it can be on lfo envelopes it can be on anything in this case the envelope that you're seeing on each of these oscillator tabs is the volume envelope essentially so if i have this saw wave again and i want it to have a, a gentler attack i can bring this out now you hear that it takes about 550 milliseconds to really reach its top point and now the sustain is at zero db which is at the very top so once it hits that top point as long as my finger stays on the key it's going to keep playing at that volume however if i bring the sustain down to here let's say and the decay time is you know about a second over the course of a second let's put it actually a second it's going to reduce in volume to this negative 17 decibels so you'll hear what that sounds like here and then obviously the curve kind of uh, makes it get most of the way there pretty quickly. Okay, uh, release time is just when I when I let go of the key, how long it's going to continue playing for. So I put this back up. So you can see my hand get off the key, and it keeps playing for about another second after until it gets to its final uh, negative infinite, um, you know, position. Um, you have a coarse pitch and a fine tuning over here. The coarse. Uh, basically just runs it up in the harmonic series. Um, I'm going to get to that in a second as well, so maybe I'll, I'll just pause there for a second. Fine-tuning just moves it up in centitones. And by the way, you'll notice that uh, in Ableton, something that's pretty cool that I feel like a lot of people don't utilize as much as they should, anything that you hover over, especially on a native uh, Ableton device, like only on a native uh, Ableton device, will bring up basically what it's doing over here in the left-hand corner. And you can always hide or show that with this little arrow right here. If I hover over the volume envelope decay time, it tells me right on the side there the time needed to travel from the peak value to the sustain level. Every one of these, you know, oscillator A waveform um, velocity here, this is the level to velocity. Um, all of these are going to show you essentially what they do on the left-hand side there. So uh, you notice that there's an envelope section and an oscillator section here. So let's put this back down. Let's just put all these to the default here. Um, if you click over into the oscillator section, this is where you actually see what makes up this sound wave um, in the form of harmonics. So um, any frequency, let's take a, uh, a sine wave to start off with. All right, and I'll just play uh, like a low, you may not even hear it, but you can kind of see it right there. That's like a 82 point, let me go one lower than that actually. All right, I'm playing a low E, that should be hitting at about 41.2 Hertz. All right, that is the fundamental frequency. A sine wave is representative of just one frequency. So if I have a sine wave showing right here, you can now see that that frequency is all that is in this oscillator tab. So when I play it, it's just gonna give me that 41.2 Hertz frequency, which is the frequency of a low E note that I'm playing. Now, as I draw in extra harmonics, you'll notice that the shape of the wave is kind of changing a little bit. Like if I go a little crazier, you can kind of see a little stuff get, get in there. And now that's what I got. So each harmonic is a multiple of the fundamental frequency. So if I'm playing this 41.2 hertz wave, the second harmonic is going to be 82.4 uh, hertz. The third harmonic is going to be 123.6 because I'm just adding 41.2 to that every single time. So the fourth harmonic would be, uh, what, 160 uh something <laughs> around there my mouth isn't like that great um so i use this all the time personally when i am designing uh like my sub bass and i do so in operator um this is kind of a, a good pattern that i like to use right there you throw it in there once you start throwing some saturation and some other effects on this that's a really good like harmonic basis to have your subs be uh, really thick in the low end, but still audible on smaller speakers like uh, iPhones and laptop speakers, things like that. Um, it's really important that you have those harmonics there because if I just have this one frequency here and it's sitting at 41.2 hertz, most speaker systems realistically can't produce that. Like until you get to, um, you know, bigger PAs, subs, and uh, like actual stage, um, you know, club or festival systems a majority of speakers uh, even like home PA subs are going to have um, maybe not a tough time getting to like 40 hertz but much below that yeah so um, okay cool let's keep going then <laughs> uh, 
getting back into frequency modulation, um, I'm not going to go through what frequency modulation does or the math behind it. Um, actually, of all the topics that I do in my lessons, it's one that um, I'm kind of the shakiest on myself. And I've talked to uh, other producers, and it's a hard one to cover. Um, as someone once said to me, there is a limit to um, how much we know about a lot of uh, audio sciences. So if someone does have a really great, succinct way to explain why frequency modulation does what it does, um, feel free to drop in the comments uh, or, or get at me on SoundCloud, message me on there, Instagram, wherever. Um, but for the most part, it's important to know uh, not necessarily how it works, but just what it does to the sound. So when I'm uh, basically just routing one sine wave into the next, you can see how it starts bringing up these harmonics there. However, that does come at a little bit of sacrifice in your low end, which is going to come from this low, low harmonic there. All right, so if I turn up the course pitch here to two, this is the second harmonic. So if I'm still playing that low E note, now this is actually playing uh, an 82.4 hertz wave rather than the fundamental because I have it on the second course. If I turn it up to three, it's going to be playing the third harmonic, which again, you just add that fundamental frequency to it. So that's 123.6. Um, so on its own, you get something like this. Let me put this all down. All right, see, if you go two, that's the 82.4. If you go back to the one, which is just the main frequency I'm playing, 41.2. So you can get some really cool effects when you start playing with the course and frequency modulating, FMing one oscillator into the next. So if I put it up to like six here, you get some kind of cool stuff. And as you start playing with all these, I mean, this is still, uh, so what, this is a square wave, another sine wave in there. Start getting some really cool, like, metallic sounds. Um, and it's going to sound a little almost detuned or out of tune because um, you'll notice, like, if you, if you keep adding that fundamental frequency up, uh, you know, 11 times, you're not necessarily going to end up with a frequency that happens to fall right in the scale of E. So um, they are mathematically related. So there is still a, a, like a musical relationship there, but not musical in the sense of um, like our traditional like Western uh, scales. So that is important to note, um, but, you know, obviously, like, if we're making experimental bass music, it's a really cool way to get some um, some awesome sort of, like, dissonant kind of sounds there. Um, so each of these tabs, like I said, is going to have the exact same set of controls here. You're mainly just looking at your um, amplitude envelope, your volume envelope. I'm going to reset all these really quick. And um, <clears throat> you also have the ability to loop this down here. Um, you can definitely find some creative ways to do that. I'll just set this up a couple... Uh, Octaves will just move that keyboard up here. So if I have like, uh, let's see, saw wave on that, just so you can hear it a little bit better there. And I put it on loop and I go to sync. That's going to sync with the tempo. And I put it on, you know, um, like eighth notes. Now it's not going to sound like it's doing anything because uh, this envelope stays open the entire time. But if I make the envelope close pretty quickly, and that's going to be in line with my project here. If I go to 16th or 12th would be triplets. <laughs> Sick. All right. So you can definitely play with that loop feature down here. Um, you also have the ability to just loop based on time. You just choose how often it loops. Now, again, the time has to be uh, essentially shorter than the decay here for you to really get the effect. So play around with the decay time as well as the loop time on that one. Um, beat is going to be uh, uh, similar to uh, sync. And trigger is, um, I guess it's just going to, once it hits its final spot, it'll just repeat again so oh maybe not actually i take that back you know i don't really use trigger that often <laughs> i mostly use the sync um every now and again for certain sounds i'll use like the time loop so sync and time loop are pretty much what you'll be using the most um okay so on here you can program in um this is just like 
velocity to output level. So uh, in the same way that, um, you know, a lot of sounds are naturally have some sort of velocity program, where in other words, if you hit the key really hard, you get a really loud sound. If you hit the key a little bit softer, you get a softer sound. Um, I have mine set to zero just because I like, um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily always using operator in that way. Now, if I make uh, an operator patch that's meant to be more of like, um, a pad in the background or like a little like bell lead thing, I might program in some uh, some velocity there. And you can always set that up to 100 or anywhere in between if you don't want the range to be as crazy, you know, like if you want it to mostly be kind of in a similar range, but a little bit of variation in the volume based on how hard you hit the key, you can set it to like 50% or 30% or whatever. Um, key is uh, zero. This is by, by uh, default. So like the level to the key is like basically if it's at zero it just means that the volume is going to be the same across your entire keyboard if you want the volume to change based on what key you're hitting you can turn that up to 100 percent or anywhere in the middle as well so let's move on to um these guys over here all right so up first we got our lfo tab now by default let's see what i have playing all right so by default um it's going to be <clears throat> your destination A is going to be set to A, B, C, and D oscillators. Now, what it's not telling you is that is the pitch of those oscillators. So, if I turn this up, if I let's do it a little slower and turn this amount up, you can hear that both of my oscillators are moving up and down in pitch um, at, let's see, uh, LFO frequency uh, 78.6. So it actually tells you the hertz uh, on the bottom left of my screen right there, um, 2.3 times a second. It's going to repeat. I don't know what the numbers are actually based off of. I guess it's just the normal Ableton values, which is always 128, 0 through 127. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it'll tell you what the actual frequency is down in that bottom left corner down here as you move it. Um, so you can choose what you want there. I don't use this, uh, you know, the LFO set to pitch that often with the amount super high however i do use it all the time with a low amount for a little bit of like a vibrato on the on the instrument so if you listen to my music you've probably heard that effect plenty of times um now over here you can choose what the lfo shape is now that pitch is basically going to be moving up and down in the uh, form of a sine wave. You can make it a square wave so it just alternates back and forth. Um, change the rate again. Uh, you can choose any of these and that'll just mean that the, the pitch or whatever parameter you have this mapped to is going to oscillate. The LFO is going to oscillate um, in that shape. So we'll leave it on sign for now. L, you have low, high, and sync. Um, Low, I you know, I use a lot for uh, vibrato kind of stuff because I'm just choosing sort of an amount that sounds like, you know, the natural vibrato on an instrument or like an opera singer's voice or something. You can go to high if you want the rate to be a lot faster. So now... It's already at zero. It's basically at the highest of the low. So if you just want faster rates, go to high. And if you want sync, that'll again sync with the tempo of the project. So. Okay, got it. So if you want the LFO to affect something different than the pitch, simply turn these off. And it gives you the option to turn on the filter right here. Now you'll notice it's grayed out because my filter actually isn't on right now. So let me turn my filter on first by checking that little blue box. Go back over here. And now the filter has to be closed a little bit for it to have somewhere to go. Uh, in other words, if the filter is all the way open, meaning that it's letting all the sounds through, then uh, it oscillating won't do anything because all the sound is already coming through. So there'll be no real change. Now, if you have it a little lower, let's turn off the LFO for a second so you can hear um, what the filter does on its own. It's, you know, essentially just literally a filter. So if you click on filter here, you can see it more visually. You have your classic filter controls, like your resonance here. 
Uh, you can choose whether it's a low pass, high pass, band pass, notch, or morph filter. Um, you can choose between a, a 12 decibel per octave slope or a 24 decibel per octave slope. So this one's just going to be a little bit uh, sharper of a slope. Just a little bit different sounds. All right. And so with that on, and I set it back to like, let's say here. And I turn my LFO back on with it set to filter. And this destination A, by the way, 100%, just again, tells you how much you want it to do the thing that you're telling it to do. So I just have it set at 100%. And let's say I have, uh, turn this up a little bit, and I still have it set to 1 8. So, and that'll be synced up to my tempo. And you can change the rate to whatever you want as well, like. So you can see that as I turn up the amount, it's telling it that that oscillation will go farther. So I can then set this even lower if I want and have it still reach almost all the way up to the top if I turn the amount all the way up. Okay, cool. So got that for the LFO tab. Um, now, a couple things in here. You'll notice that you also have an envelope present. The envelope essentially works the same way. It's still an ADSR envelope, attack, decay, sustain, release points. However, it's telling you what that envelope will do, what those parameters will do relative to your LFO now. So, for instance, let's turn off the filter and just put this back on pitch just so you can kind of hear this play out a little bit. Um, you know, I'm going to go back to low, put this up here. So... <laughs> Got a nice little vibrato thing there. Now, if I have this attack set to like, you know, two seconds, it's going to take it about two seconds to actually bring that LFO in. So, and then you can, of course, have it dip back out too if you'd like over however much time. So, that sounds like there you go. Um, all right, that pretty much covers the LFO tab. We're going to go back to the filter tab here. I'll turn my filter on and turn this off. Actually, I'm just going to leave the filter, the LFO alone for the time being. All right, so back to the filter tab. Again, you have an envelope here, um, and you can get some really cool sounds by just using the envelope with the filter, for instance. Uh, and you have to make sure and turn the envelope up to get it to do anything. For instance, if I change this, but still have the envelope at 0%, it's not going to do anything. But you will see that. This is like where I'm at with the filter when I actually move the filter around. And you can always drag this, by the way, and it'll just affect your frequency and resonance at the same time. Kind of get it to where you want it to be set. And then let's go over here. Actually, I'm going to turn my keyboard down a couple octaves. Get that. All right, already getting some kind of nice tones out of just the most basic sound design, uh, just like a saw wave with some filtering. Um, and you can still get some pretty dope stuff with that. So if I turn this envelope all the way up to 100% now and choose my envelope time, you'll get some stuff like this. Maybe make it open up kind of slow. And now remember, this is going to start wherever you have this. So the minimum parameter here, the initial and the you know release point here, um, are going to be at 5.17 kilohertz. So 5, a little over 5,000 hertz. Now, if you put this lower, you're going to have it start a little lower. If you put it a little higher, we're going to have it start a little higher. Resonance here. Maybe try it with this. Now, the filter also has uh, a shaper built into it where you can get a little bit of clipping and uh, some distortion from that and give you some extra harmonics. Turn that up in the shaper drive. A little bit more thickness there if you want that. And you can actually put it on a different filter mode, such as OSR, MS2, any of these. 
and they'll usually have a drive associated so you can give it some extra uh, gain and cause some more clipping and some some more uh, harmonics <laughs> Okay, I think that basically covers that. Going into the pitch tab, at this point, I feel like I don't really need to explain what uh, the envelope stuff does. You kind of get that, but there is also an envelope for pitch. So, uh, and again, this is by default, I think, set to 100%. You can always put it at zero if you want. Uh, it won't do anything or anywhere in between. So how I would use this is, let's say I want like uh, each one of my bases to kind of start from low and come in to a little high thing. So if I pull this down, here I can accentuate it by making it a little longer so you really hear what's going on it'll end at the pitch I'm playing but it'll start uh, about 28 semitones lower and work its way up there across 1.25 seconds um, you can also do it the opposite way just pull this up and have it start high and come low And this is pretty popular for like making 808s and things like that. You kind of want a little bit of attack so that it mimics the kick drum. Um, yeah, and again, if you uh, want to play with how far that happens, you can just turn down the pitch envelope here. Um, spread is just going to give it some, uh, I think they use like a Haas effect delay. So um, I'll get into what that is in my sound design tutorial. But essentially, uh, I think it just adds a little bit, uh, a tiny little bit of delay between the left and right channels so that it gives the... Uh, appearance of sounding really wide um that's fine for most sounds but if you have anything with low end in it um you probably don't want to use it on that so i'm going to keep this down to zero for right now um anything with like any frequencies present below like 100 hertz uh, 120 hertz you don't really want to put any sort of stereo width on at all um, and i can get more into why that is uh, probably also in the sound design stuff when we go a little bit more in depth um, okay, so on pitch, you have a couple other uh, important things here. Um, you know, by default, destination A is still the pitch of these, since that's what you want. However, you can also assign a destination B and play around with routing uh, this same envelope into a different thing that isn't pitch. Um, same with most of these, by the way, you'll notice like the LFO, you have a destination B. So if you want to assign that LFO rate and amount to a different parameter, uh, maybe it is... Um, you know, the LFO rate itself or uh, the uh, filter uh, drive or something like that or the filter morph. Those are all things you can play with a little bit. Um, and then the LFO will just affect that as well as whatever you have it affecting in Destination A. So back down to pitch real quick. Um, there is the glide time on here, which is going to be really important if, uh, let's see, I'm going to go to my global tab really quick and set this to one voice. And once it's on a mono synth kind of layout, if you put on glide, you can choose the glide time, which is just going to give you a smoother transition between notes. So like, whereas without glide, it's so glide can be pretty nice for doing some little mono synth stuff. Um, all right, what else do we got in here? Not, I think that's pretty much it. Now, keep in mind that all these have a, a loop point as well. Uh, each of these tabs have their own loop, so you can loop just the filter uh, if you want to do that instead of looping the actual oscillator themselves. So keep that in mind that each of these loops work independent for the tab that they are a part of. So if I just wanted to loop this filter envelope, I could do that without actually having to loop any of the oscillators themselves. Um, and let's see, finally, we have the global tab here. So global tab is we're going to set a couple things like number of voices. So if you want to be able to play any chords or anything like that, you're going to need it obviously a little higher than uh, one. So um, all right, uh, set that to whatever you want. And when I'm making basses, it's usually at one. Um, when I'm making things that aren't basses that I might need to play chords um, or have some overlap in the notes, it's usually at six or something that isn't one um up here again is the routings that we sort of touched on before um like i said this means that really a is the only thing playing and each of these just route into the next one which eventually ends in being routed into a so uh you can definitely get the most amount of fming craziness stuff going on with this one on the far other end of the spectrum we have all in parallel which means that they're just four independent oscillators they're just playing their own sound 
um, everything in between, you kind of start to learn how this this works. Uh, it, it's mostly pretty logical. Um, in this one, for instance, you have A, B, and C. I'm just looking at the colors to get that. So yellow, teal, purple, A, B, and C playing in parallel. And then D routes into C. So D can still frequency modulate C, but C, B, and A are all going to play independently. So if you turn down the volume of A and B, you can still play C. Um, however, if you turn down the volume of C, D again won't play because D in this case is not an independent oscillator. It's only there to frequency modulate C. So each one of these um, I use, uh, where is it? This one, a bunch as well, where basically you have A running independently and then you have B running independently, but B can be FM'd by C, which can be FM'd by D. Um, so each of these, you, you start to just kind of understand like, how they work. In this case, A is the only oscillator playing, but rather than in this first one where D routes into C, routes into B, routes into A, in this case, C, B, B, C, and D all route into A independently of each other. So uh, if I have all these down and I have this going and I, and I have that routing chosen, I can still FM A by just turning up D or C or B totally independently this one sounds a little different because i still have it on a saw wave um now the difference is with that first routing if uh if b is off then oh we gotta put it back on this first routing if if b is off then c and d aren't going to do anything because they're eventually routing their way into b which routes into a in this one they are all routing independently um, so most of them, like I said, it just you start to look at the shapes and you kind of like get what's going on based on that sort of pattern. Um, this one is you have A and C run independently, and then B modulates A, D modulates C. Um, this one is A, B, C are all running independently, and D FMs all three at the same time. Um, so yeah, uh, I find myself using a lot. Um, I use the parallel one a lot. I use this guy a lot where it gives me a little bit of uh, room to FM stuff if I want to, but I can also just run them as independent oscillators. Um, and even just with that, you know, even let's just put it on all parallel for a second and show you some of the tones you can just get out of just running these in parallel. So let's say I have like, all right, put my keyboard down. I got my nice uh, like subby note from my A oscillator. I'll put these up so it's a little more audible. All right, so I got that. Now with B, turn up my saw wave a little bit get that to where i want it let's say with c i have like uh you know a sine wave where i pull up the course a little bit that's like two octaves up at four maybe put it up to like seven so it's a little or eight and let me put this back on glide so i can play it as more of like a mono synth bass there we go all right, and then D is uh, its own thing as well. So let me just draw in something kind of crazy on D. And maybe turn the level down here. So. You can get some cool tones just by playing them as independent oscillators, but obviously you also open up a whole world of FM goodness when you start playing with them uh, and their different routings through this tab over here. Um, also in the global tab, you have a bunch of assignments. So uh, the pitch bend amount is here. That's an important one. I usually keep mine at 12, sometimes 24. That just means that if I'm playing one note, wow. Wow. I can just use my pitch bend to go up a whole two octaves. Uh, like I said, I usually use it, leave it at, at, uh, at 12 though. Uh, so... Um, we have, I think by default, by the way, it starts at like five or maybe it'd be two. So, uh, if you're playing live using operator, um, and you want, you know, the pitch bend to work like a traditional keyboard pitch bend where it only goes up like two or three semitones, then you can always set it to that as well. Um, velocity, uh, key after touch. These are all just, uh, things that you can assign a different parameter to. So for instance, if I want my pitch bend to do something other than, um, just pitch, like I can have my pitch bend move the. The filter for instance then i would just put that on filter frequency turn my filter on 
And then have, uh, let's set the envelope back down so it's not really doing anything there. And then, uh, let's see here. I think I gotta actually turn this up. So filter frequency with pitch. I guess it's still moving pitch at the same time. Um, let me actually, yeah, that's that's fine. I'll put this on my mod wheel instead. So I have a mod script right there as well. Filter frequency. All right, great. So now if I do this, let's see, do I also need to, oh, set the amount to 100. Again, if you forget to set the amount up, it won't do anything if it's at zero. So always remember that. All right, if I move this up a little more, you'll get a little more open. And I'm just doing that with the with the mod wheel on my keyboard. Um, all right, great. That about covers it. Um, just uh, the basics of how operator works and uh, what each of the tabs are. Um, we're gonna get into how to make some really cool sounds. Let's start with operator uh, in a little bit later on uh, with uh, the the actual sound design tutorial series that I'm gonna do here in uh, in a little bit. So. Uh, again, thanks for watching. Um, subscribe if you want to uh, stay up to date with more of these tutorials. Uh, like I've said in the past, I'm probably going to try and start uh, doing these pretty frequently and um, get through a whole lot of information. So uh, eventually we'll start getting more and more complex. So I definitely wanted to go ahead and start out with uh, you know, the, the simpler stuff, the more basic stuff, because I know a lot of friends of mine that um, when they come to take a lesson with me, there's a lot of basics that we need to cover, uh, and I want people to have access to to those sort of basic things without going and going to watch like uh, some super advanced sound design tutorial on YouTube first. So I'm trying to do this in order, um, but yeah, subscribe and like and comment if you have any questions or anything I didn't cover about operators specifically on this one. Let me know.